Just imagine if you could put an ultra-thin and transparent solar sheet on your window to generate energy, and not just from sunlight, but also artificial lights from inside your room. Wouldn't that be totally cool? Well, this is what Japan's recent technological invention is. So in today's video, let's dive into this new innovation and how it works exactly. First of all, Japan's recent deep tech innovation introduces energy-producing windows. Seen as one of the most promising next-generation solar cells, this this recent energy generating window technology, also known as Perovskite, is exactly what Japanese startup Eneco Technologies is trying to develop. When it's ready, the Kyoto based firm hopes that its product will produce as much power as a regular solar panel of the exact same size. The co founder and chief executive of the company, Naoya Kato, said that the company is hoping to market these windows in three to four years. But he added that to use them outdoors, they need to make them durable for any kind of weather conditions so the process might actually take a little longer. Startups of this kind are called deep tech. They are small firms that are looking to merge high-tech engineering innovation with many scientific discoveries. The hope is that it'll lead to the development of many transformational products. But a successful product launch in this sector takes quite a lot of time. As a result, private venture capital funds that lend money to entrepreneurs may be more cautious to invest in them, and quite understandably so. Now, this is where Kyoto University played a critical role. It may be best known for producing more Nobel Prize winners than any other university in Asia, 11 to be exact but it also finances new startups by researchers as well as students through its two venture capital funds. Endicote Technologies is actually one of the beneficiaries and has received a total of 500 million yen. That's an impressive sum of $3.6 million. The money came from a $300 million fund that the university received from the Japanese government back in 2015 to encourage entrepreneurship and technological development. So how did Kyoto University help in this innovation? Koji Moroda, who heads the the university's Office of Society Academia Collaboration for Innovation said that Kyoto University was pretty strong in very hard science fields like regenerative medicine, clean tech energy, and stem cell science. But in order to commercialize these deep tech companies, it required a long time and a large sum of money. Mr. Moroda also added that while a typical venture capital fund's investment period may be 8 to 10 years, that's not long enough for deep tech, so the university scheme offers up to 20 years of support. Since Kyoto Kyoto University started its innovation department and investment fund almost seven years ago. The number of startups created by its students has more than doubled to 242. That's second only to Tokyo University, which also received similar funding from the government, but Kyoto University's growth rate is a lot higher in comparison. In fact, even before the university started offering support to entrepreneurs, the city of Kyoto was well known for producing startups. These include none other than the famous Nintendo. Although it may be just a computer game giant today. When it launched way back in 1889, it made playing cards. Pretty interesting, right? Toshimi Hitora, a Kyoto University graduate and the boss of Flosphia, notes that Kyoto's uniqueness is actually being small and yet diverse. Since the university is at the heart of it and there are so many researchers in a small community, basically anyone can access the information you need to start a business. However, many of the Kyoto-based company's founders also report that, unlike firms in Tokyo, they don't have enough customers in Kyoto, so they had to think globally from the beginning. Mr. Hitora added that it had been more than 10 years since they started Flosphia, because deep tech took a lot of time. But despite the long time span, he felt that the Kyoto people understood the process. Next, how Japan is improving in technology and innovation. About 30 years ago, Japan was a pioneer in the semiconductor industry according to stats. But today, it has less than 10% market share. For Flosphia to establish a significant presence in the highly competitive global semiconductor industry, one dominated by firms such as Taiwan's TSMC and South Korea's Samsung will be quite a challenge, especially considering the fact that China and the US are also actively trying to put their stamp in the market. In the US, this move is being led by the White House itself. The House of Representatives Representatives even passed a government act in July that commits a $280 billion support package
shortage for domestic chip production and research. The U.S. wished to reduce its dependence on other nations for supplies. Still, Toshimi Hitora believes that Japanese producers have their own strengths. He believes that Japan is pretty good at doing basic research and working with new materials, so he feels they have a big potential. He added that Flosphia now even has alliances with most of Taiwan's main chip manufacturers. Mr. Hitora noted that semiconductors were needed globally, so some governments might try to intervene to ensure the supply for their home markets. But it takes a long time to produce semiconductors. To mass produce them, they need a lot of stakeholders and a lot of businesses in many countries, which is why he believed their alliances with other companies were so important. As Japan plays catch up in the semiconductor sector, Kyoto University's ability to patiently play the long run game with firms such as Flosphia increases the hope that the country will be very successful. And now for some other related news. Firstly, China's SciTech innovation spending hits record high. With the massive increase in government spending on science and tech innovation, China has markedly improved its SciTech strength and innovation competency over the past decade. According to data released by the National Bureau of Statistics this Tuesday, China's government expenditure on SciTech innovation in 2021 exceeded 1.07 trillion yuan, about $150.5 billion to be exact. The country's ratio of government spending on scientific research to GDP also jumped to 2.44% in 2021 from 1.91% in 2012. Plus, the country's funding for basic research grew at an average annual rate of 15.4%, which is 3.7% points faster than that of the whole society in the same period. In 2021 alone, the number of new product projects developed by industrial enterprises with annual revenues of more than 20 million yuan was 959,000, which is about three times that of 2012. The annual revenue of these enterprises from new products hit 29.6 trillion yuan, 2.7 times higher than in 2012. In addition, China has also cultivated over 40,000 national specialized and sophisticated enterprises, as well as 4,762 little giants that serve as a dynamic force driving the country's industrial chain cooperation and innovation. According to the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, these little giant companies are leading small and medium-sized enterprises that focus on niche sectors. They not only have a high market share, but also strong innovative capacity and core technologies. Next, Russia's space agency is seeking to extend ISS participation past 2024. Russia's space agency is now discussing with Moscow a continuation of its participation in the International Space Station past 2024. According to a Roscosmos official, Sergei Krikalev, who is the head of Russia's human spaceflight programs, told reporters that Roscosmos has started to discuss extending the participation in the ISS program with the government and hope to have permission to continue next year. In late July, Russia said that it would quit the ISS after 2024 and build one of its own in the future. Krikalev admitted that building a new station would not happen that quickly, so they would probably keep flying until they had any new infrastructure. His remarks came during a NASA press conference ahead of Wednesday's launch of a SpaceX rocket that would carry a Russian cosmonaut, two American, and one Japanese astronaut to the ISS. ISS partner countries, which include the United States, Russia, Europe, Canada, and Japan, are for the moment only committed to operating the orbiting laboratory until 2024, even though US officials have already stated that they want to continue all the way until 2030. Finally, carbon and nitrogen cycling discovered on Qinghai Tibet Plateau. Chinese researchers have now figured out the main factors affecting carbon and nitrogen cycling on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. The report came according to a research article published recently in the journal Nature Reviews Earth and Environment. Sustainable grassland management, green technology development, and ecological engineering on the plateau can help maintain the carbon sink and curb greenhouse emissions, which basically absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and stores carbon-containing chemical compounds. These discoveries were made by researchers from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Hunan Normal University, and China's Hohai University. The researchers found out that the soil on the plateau contains substantial carbon stocks, with over 90% of carbon stocked in the soil and 1.72 billion tons of nitrogen stored in the upper 2 meters of the permafrost region. And that's a wrap for this video. What did you think of Japan's recent deep tech energy generating windows? Let us know in the comments below. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. See you in the next video.